Hey everyone, welcome to the first Toronto Houdini user group of the year 2021. I have with me Ian Harvey, who is a former intern. He was interning remotely entirely for the duration of his internship last year, and I'm just like catching up with him now because well last year was the Houdini 18.5 and then there was a whole bunch of stuff that was wrapping towards the end of the year and we did not get a proper amount of time to like sit down and, and chat and also for him to go over the firecrackers demo scene that you guys probably seen in the Houdini 18.5 sneak peek video so that everyone is a uh, Ian's work so yeah, I just want to like take this time to talk about, actually, I would prefer to get Ian to talk about the internship so that, you know, if people are interested in the marketing internship, they can kind of hear how it actually is and what they can expect. Obviously, Ian did his internship remotely, so the experience was kind of different than somebody who had done it uh, in-house. Uh, and by in-house, I mean like the side effects HQ in Toronto. Um, so yeah, I, I'm also using this, uh, this moment actually to tell everyone who is potentially interested in applying for the marketing internship position, I'm actually not currently taking any uh, interns from now until probably like end of summer just because uh, you know, not being, not being able to do the internship in the office with other interns and with developers um, and then having the entire experience, you know, also having good hardware, attending VS presentations or VS parties or any, any sort of like CG related event in the Toronto area. Um, I think it's, it's going to be a much better experience uh, to do it in person. Uh, than remote and you know there were a whole bunch of other stuff that Ian may not know about it because he only ever knows the the remote experience um, and and it probably he'll be nice to tell you that it was like awesome but like uh, it's not like the way that I would expect for the intern to to have as an experience um, so if anybody's interested maybe like later on if if you want to leave a comment in, in the video and you're curious to know how it is, maybe I can get one of the past interns who who was like in-house and they can talk about their experience then. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think I've talked enough now. <laughs> so I'm going to pass the mic to Ian. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, so I was an intern at Side Effects a few months ago. And uh, whether or not you get the opportunity to do the internship um, remotely or in person, um, depending on your circumstances, I'd, I'd say, you know, take it because uh, it's, a, it's a really great opportunity to see like what's going on with side effects uh, sort of under the hood and like see what they're developing. Um, especially in the uh, marketing internship, you, you're you working with like the new tools that they're developing for the next release. So in my case, like I was working with the uh, Pyroburst Source SOP uh, and interfacing with uh, Attila, Attila Torok, who was really helpful in like describing all the uh, details of the uh, SOP and how I could get the most out of it. And like this was going on while he was still like creating the tool. So over time, iterating on how I would make my effect as the tool was being developed was definitely a cool process. Um, I would recommend you invest in a good internet connection um, because, uh, especially for this effect, it was it was a pretty large sim. So um, there were occasions when it would have been nice to have like gigabit internet. Sadly, uh, where I'm he living is, right he now, he is talking I, about uh, the the access to the farm. Yeah, it's just uh, just FYI. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Even though he has a good machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so a good machine is a is definitely a plus to getting the internship remotely. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I should clarify uh, for everyone and, and Ian. So I am not taking any interns uh, remotely, actually. Ian is the oh, one gotcha. and only. I'm going to be the only, only one. One and only, yes. <laughs> 
uh, for the okay. foreseeable future, just because um, exactly actually for the reasons that uh, Ian's talking about, you know, logistics with hardware and yeah. uh, internet, like your pipe has to be solid and there's it's kind of shitty to have that as a as a requirement and then exclude you from the internship just because of that so i think it's unfair and generally i'm choosing the people based on you know your your talent like your your artistic talent your technical knowledge and you know to judge you like you know based on how fast your internet is or what kind of computer you have is uh, i think it's uh, unfair so that's that's yeah. actually the decision, the reason for making the decision to not have interns remotely. So, wow. Well, I was remote a guinea, guinea rat. <laughs> the experiment, <laughs> the experiment so far has failed. So, um. no, you you were alive. <laughs> you you started your new gig just this week. So, so yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't like a dumpster fire. <laughs> right? It turned no, out no. okay. Yeah, I mean. For me personally, it it worked out great. Um, yeah, I even though it was remote, like it was a it was a good time, and I I was able to get employment afterwards. Um, so uh, I guess all that stuff I said about you know having a good machine working remote, it, it's not going to apply to any future interns. But you'll have a way better experience just being in the office, definitely. Um. <laughs> What about the actual like demo work? Do you want to tell guys a bit about the process of how we arrived to this final scene? Yeah. You know, um, all, the, all your like forest walking and scans and stuff like that? <laughs> so originally we were going to actually have like a, like a scene that the firecrackers would be in. And, and the firecrackers themselves were originally just going to be like one strip of firecrackers uh just a sort of a small uh sort of like three-quarter view of the firecrackers uh on like a street or something and i had some previous experience with photogrammetry so i did, went out and did some scans um and played around with the uh, the alice vision tool that uh is inside of x labs and then like we did some tests with that and and it was looking okay but it wasn't like amazing it wasn't i don't know it wasn't like a i wouldn't say the effect that i created was like a showstopper you know so we wanted to make it just a lot a lot bigger pretty much so we we scaled it up and i think the final shot is like uh it's around 300,000 firecrackers from like um, the 12 that you had on on the ground or something yeah like yeah like like <laughs> 12 firecrackers like all right that that's okay and it, you get to see like yeah we, i was using pyro burst source for it but there's so much so much cooler stuff you can do as opposed to just one little strip of firecrackers ian ian is being nice by not mentioning the number of times that the <laughs> the version the look of this demo changed so from the like a strip of firecrackers on his driveway scan uh, and then like him going to uh, what was it your school and, and scanning like a staircase with some metal railing yeah. and, and then hanging like a few strips off a few strips of the firecrackers yeah. off of that and that didn't really work because it was kind of like <laughs> meh and and then and then uh, then we found a reference that was like yes yeah this is this is it <laughs> Did you find that reference? Who found that? Yeah, I found it. Yeah. I was like sending a few of those to Attila and we were like going back and forth and and then pretty much that one was like, yeah, this this is the one. So yeah. then then we came back to you after like you had gone through all those scans and then <laughs> uh, you were like trying all these different uh, like camera movements and and angles and stuff and none of those worked. Uh, but yeah. I, I don't even remember like how many how many weeks like we we were like on that and then and Attila and I were like uh, yeah he's gonna have to like just throw away <laughs> all of that <laughs> it's like yeah but it's for his own good it'll be good on his reel yeah. <laughs> so yeah I mean so here that's, we are that that's like part of the internship that I didn't really understand like 
there's gonna be times when you're just gonna have to like throw away a lot of stuff. So and you I didn't guess understand? Any, well, I didn't. Uh, I I didn't expect it, and oh, it's yeah. sort of like <laughs> something that's like that's just part of the process. And before the internship, like I didn't really have that in me, but now it's like it's kind of something you'll be doing, you know, for the rest of your career in visual effects or games or wherever you end up. Like, there's just things that will be scrapped, and it's like a good, it's a good muscle to grow. Yeah, it's not, it's not anything like personal, right? We just, yeah. we just want to make the most visually interesting thing possible, and also like you get a portfolio piece at the end. That's that's yeah. kind of like the the end goals, right? So. Okay, well, so I think uh, that's a wrap for this chat, and we can uh, go into your presentation now. Awesome. Yeah, I hope it's uh, helpful for uh, people to learn the process I took with the project, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy watching it. Okay, leave you to it. Hey, everybody. My name's Ian Harvey. I'm a recent graduate from Savannah College of Art and Design's visual effects program and a current side effects intern. I'll be going over my workflow for the Firecracker Explosion project from the Houdini 18.5 sneak peek. For manageability on a home workstation, this version will only be a fraction of the size of the original project. Thanks for watching, and I hope this is helpful for you. Alright, let's start off by creating the Firecracker geometry. I'll start by creating a geometry node named Firecracker's Setup. Let's dive in and create a sphere that will be the volume that will contain our Firecracker strand geometry. I'll translate the sphere up on the Y so that once we settle our geometry, it will have space to fall. I use the points from volume to create our scatter points. I'll increase the point separation so that we won't have too many scattered strands of Firecrackers. I'll also jitter them up a bit. I'll drop down a copy to points and create our strand geometry with a grid. I'll scale it down on the X so that we have a long skinny strand. We will only need two columns since we only want two firecrackers on each side of the strand. Let's give this enough rows to be able to bend properly. Put this in the left input of the copy to points. We have our strands copied, but I'd like each strand to have a different rotation. We'll use an attribute noise set to N to adjust the rotation of each strand. I'll change the range values to zero centered values, and I'll adjust the element size slightly. I'd like to create a few more strands, so I'll increase the uniform scale of the sphere. The result of the settle simulation will look a bit more natural if we add some noise to our initial geometry. I'll do this with another attribute noise set to P. I'll reduce the amplitude and increase the element size. I'll move one strand away from the rest. This will be where the pyro simulation spreads from to lead into the pile of firecrackers. Now let's set up the vellum settle sim. I'll use a vellum configure cloth with the default values for our constraints. Create a vellum solver. Enable ground position. Under forces, I'll set gravity to be negative 50 so our strips fall a bit faster. I'll use a clean sop to remove all the other attributes on the geometry. We'll only need point position. Let's cache our sim. We'll only need to cache to around frame 30, 
as that's the number of frames the strips will take to settle on the ground plane. After the settle sim is done, load the final frame of the cache. Let's make the firecracker geometry that will copy to the settled strips. I'll pack the firecracker geo and copy it over to the strips. The copied geometry isn't following the path of the strips properly. To fix this, we'll use a polyframe saw. Disable normal name and tangent name and enable by tangent name. Set this to up. We'll just need to change the orientation of our tube from the y-axis to the x-axis. The tube should now follow the strips. Let's create a fuse down the center of each strip. Wire a group node from the output of the settle cache. Let's name this group original points and set the group type to points. Create an attribute wrangle set to run over primitives. To add a point to the center of each primitive, use the add point function. Use a delete sop to remove all the points from the original points group that we just made. Create an add sop. Under the polygons tab, change the add mode to groups of endpoints. To add the points properly, we can reference the number of rows in the strip geometry. We can use a poly wire sop to construct polygon tubes around the polylines. Let's merge the firecrackers and fuses and create a group for each of them. I'll catch this out as firecrackers geo. Let's set up the pyro sources in a new geo node. I'll merge in the firecracker geo we just made. Use a bound sop to create a bounding box around the firecrackers. We only need the bottom face. In a divide sop, I'll use bricker polygons to create a point grid for the pyro spread solver to run over. I'll use an add sop to remove the geometry but keep the points. I'll remove some points from areas that aren't near the firecrackers. I'll do this so the spread solver doesn't reach an area too quickly.
Let's group some points to set where the spread should begin. I'll call this spark pause. Use an attribute adjust float sop to create a temperature attribute on our spark pause group. Set its constant value to 1. Drop down a pyro source spread. I'll increase the frame range a bit. I'll decrease the cooling rate to 0. In the fuel tab under injection noise, I'll disable add noise. I'd like the spread to be faster. I'll increase the diffusion rate from 1 to 2. I'll also adjust the diffusion rate noise. I'll set the noise type to alligator and the element size to 2. I like the way this spread looks. I'll cache this out as pyro source spread. Before we use the result of the pyro source spread in the pyro burst source SOP, we'll need to generate a start frame float attribute. To do this, inside of a SOP solver, we will use an attribute wrangle to determine whether or not a point has been burned yet. If so, assign the start frame equal to the current frame. This will define the start frame for each burst. Now that we have our start frame attribute on our scattered points, transfer this attribute back onto the points of our firecracker geometry. We'll do this so we only generate bursts where there are firecrackers present. I'll use a clean sop to remove all attributes aside from start frame. It will only be necessary to cache the final frame of this since each point has a corresponding start frame attribute assigned to it. We won't need to generate nearly as many bursts as there are points in our original firecracker geometry. I'll use a fuse with a snap distance of 0.1 to reduce the total number of points. When we wire our points into the pyro burst source, we can see that all our bursts have generated on the first frame. Under the burst animation tab, set start frame to use attribute. This will specify to use our start frame attribute that we made earlier. I'll adjust some parameters in the burst shape tab to more closely reflect a firecracker explosion. I'll also add some variation to the expansion duration. I'll reduce the outward expansion and add some directional expansion. The directional expansion parameter will bias the burst towards the direction on the burst shape tab.
I'll add some velocity noise on the output attributes tab. The burst components tab allows us to specify the sources we would like to have present in our pyrosim. I'll create burn, temperature, and density attributes. You can also define burst component values based on source points. I used an attribute noise to adjust the burn attribute. Use a blast to remove all the points below zero on the y-axis. I do this so we don't have sources below the ground plane in our pyrosim. I'll catch this out as pyroburst source. Now that we have our burst source points cached, I'll set up the vellum sim. I'll make a new geonode called vellum setup and start by creating a velocity volume to advect the vellum. I'll adjust the burst velocity using a flow noise and a point fob. I'll catch this out as vellum bell. I'll use the single firecracker for the source of the vellum sim. I'll use an edge fracture to split it into a few smaller pieces. I'll use a vellum cloth node with the default properties and a vellum pack node to pack it. I'll use a copy to points to source the geometry to each point from the start frame points. Use an attribute wrangle to isolate the points equal to the current frame. Use an attribute randomize on the points to copy to to rotate the firecrackers.
I'll adjust the total number of points we have to copy to using a threshold and our angle. Unlock the Vellum Solver soft and set the mission type to continuous on the Vellum Source. Enable ground collisions. Use a pop and vect by volume to source the velocity volume we just made. I'll cache this out as vellum sim. In the save filter, I'll only keep the velocity. I'll remove the firecrackers that have already passed their start frame to appear as if they're exploding. To do this, I'll transfer the start frame attribute onto the original firecracker geometry and remove all the points with the start frame attribute that's less than the current frame. Let's set up the pyro sim. I'll modify the source attributes from our bursts with a few attribute noises. I used the point grid I made earlier to get a better idea of what each noise pattern looks like. To make it look like there are individual firecrackers exploding, I set a small element size on the temperature noise. I wanted to create some larger billowing flames in the center of the firecracker pile. I created a group of points where I wanted the flames to be the largest, and added an attribute noise to affect the burn attribute of the points within it. I'll rasterize the source attributes and reference the voxel size from the pyro solver. I'll merge in the pirate source and set up some volume colliders. 
I'd like to break up the shape of the pyrosim with the vellum geometry, but I don't want to constantly source the fallen pieces on the ground. I'll remove the points if the length of their velocity is below a certain value. Create a VDB from the vellum geo, also referencing the voxel size from the pyro solver. I'll set the distance VDB name to collision and create a velocity volume from the point velocity. I'll also create a collision volume from the settled firecrackers. I'll use a VDB reshape set to dilate to make sure that we'll be able to see the influence of the Vellum Collider in the PyroSim. I'd like to source some density from the Vellum to make it appear as if the debris is pulling some smoke with it. I'll copy the velocity threshold wrangle and cull points with a bit higher velocity. I'll then create a density attribute on the points and rasterize it. I decided not to use the temperature attribute generated by the pyro burst source and instead set it entirely from the attribute noise. After caching out all our sources and collisions, I'll start shaping the pyro. For a ground plane, treat the negative y axis as a closed boundary. We'll also need to specify that the collisions are created from the volumes we made. I'll enable Calculate Speed Field to use as a control field later on. I'll set Advection Reflection to Single Project and adjust the cooling rate slightly. On the Shape tab, I'll enable Dissipation, Disturbance, Shredding, and Turbulence and tweak their respective parameters. I'll set the Dissipation Control Field to Temperature and set its control range from 0 to 0.1. I'll reduce the Disturbance Block Size to 0 0.04 and set its control field to Speed and control range from 0.3 to 1. On the Turbulence tab, I'll set the Swirl Size to 10, Pulse Length to 1, and Control Field to Temperature with a range of 1 to 2. I'll adjust the Source Scale and Source Divergence from the Temperature field. To save disk space, Convert the output to VDB and resample the velocity volume. I'll add a few extra micro solvers to our forces. I used a vortex confinement to add small swirls. I used the original disturbance micro solver to add an extra layer of detail to the disturbance we already have from the shape tab. I also added some wind.
I'll cache the sim out and start shading and lighting. I'll make three geo nodes for rendering so we don't render anything else unintentionally. I'll drop down a camera. I'll make the ground using a large grid and a bandsaw. We can rotate the grid to face the camera using a blend object node. Under the objects tab in a mantra wrap, I'll set force objects to the render nodes. In a mat net, I'll create three shaders, one for the ground, one for the firecrackers, and one for the fuses. We'll shade the pyro using the pyro bake volume sop, but first I'll add a few lights. I also added just a little touch of sheen to the firecracker shader. Back in the pyro bake volume, I'll adjust the smoke color ramp so that it's a bit darker in areas of higher density. I'll enable scatter and fire and change the source volume binding for the scatter from temperature to flame. Use the default binding of the temperature field in the fire tab to shade the quick pops of individual firecrackers exploding. I'll adjust the intensity, color, and blurring of the scatter and use the mask ramp to create transitions between the min and max emission values. This will create the effect of quick whipping flames from the high burn area we made in the pyro source. I'll unlock the pyro bake volume to adjust the scattering phase and set the absorption color to a light brown.
I'll make a volume light from the pyro, making sure to set the material to the pyro shader in the bake volume. Enable velocity blur on the render nodes for the firecrackers and pyro. Before rendering out the frames, I'll set the render engine to physically based rendering and enable motion blur. I'll also adjust the scattering phase and stochastic samples. I hope this tutorial was helpful for you. It was definitely a learning process for me, but I'm pretty happy with the results in the end. And thanks to everyone who helped me over the past few months at SideFX. It's been a really great time.